uh, so with that, I'd like to bring on our next guest, uh, state candidate, Jen Wilson. Jen. Hi, Tony. Thank How you, are you for uh, coming on the show. And I, and I must make <laughs> the, uh, the full disclosure here. Jen is running for the Minnesota State House in Egan's uh, District 51B, which is pretty much Egan and a uh, portion of the city. And uh, I am her campaign manager. So I'm saying that because, you know, when we bring guests on here, uh, you know, I try to be as unbiased as possible, ask the hard questions, get you guys the information you want. And so I think with Jen, I, the, what I could be subject to is being too hard on you <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's some, somebody that I'm working for, working with, and uh, admire a lot. Um, and then also, uh, you know, Jen and I met a number of times to uh, just talk about the campaign, her candidacy, before I became the manager. And she convinced me that she's serious, that she's committed, uh, that she wants to win, and that she wants to serve the people of Minnesota. Uh, so these were all, uh, you know, things I found very, very admirable. So appreciate you coming on the show, Jen, and I'll try not to ask you too hard of questions. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And just to tell everyone, can you tell everyone a little more about the, the geography of the district, where it is, you know, so if people live there, maybe they sure. can find out. Uh, I'm running in District 51B, which is the, basically the eastern portion of Egan. It, the 35E is, is, for the most part, the dividing line. There's a little chunk that sort of goes west of, of 35E, and, and then the city lines of Egan form the, uh, the north, east, and southern boundaries of the district. So the, uh, the entire district is within the city of, of Egan. Yep, and my wife and I, we, we are now residents of Egan. We were living in St. Paul for, I grew up in St. Paul, so did my wife, Leona, and we lived there for a long, long time. And it, there was a series of, of crimes that actually happened, and, and the last one being the woman who lived above us lit a, a pile of clothes on fire and um, burnt her whole place down, and our place basically became condemned, and next, thing, next day we're, we're living in Egan. <laughs> so <laughs> we're proud residents now. It's a great place to live, but Happy it's a diverse place too. And it is, and getting more so, definitely. Yeah. Can you talk about like the, the different types of people that live in Egan and, and who you've met? Well, I, I think, um, as I said, Egan is becoming more diverse. It's, it's not what I guess you would consider an, an inner ring suburb, but it's kind of the next, the next ring, and uh, we're seeing some changes in the demographics, and I think uh, it's, it's uh, important as a candidate to really address those changes and get to know uh, some of the different groups that are moving in and, and becoming a larger part of our population and find out more about their needs. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but it's a very, uh, I would say it's a very informed and uh, connected mm -hmm. community. It's really a, it, it's a place that we've been fortunate to call home for the last 14 years, and um, it, it's really a terrific place to live. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about that. There's a lot of younger families mm -hmm. that are moving to Egan. Uh, they, it's one of the things that attracted us there is the District 196, which mm -hmm. is Apple Valley, Egan, and the I forgot the other school, but uh, Rosemont. Rosemont, yep. you're right. Uh, yep. yep, you know the district better than me. <laughs> and some surrounding communities that also. Uh, uh, you, so you have the great, exists. you have the great schools. There's young families. There's it's low crime. You, mm -hmm. you get lots of land out there. Yep, um, strong business community. Oh, yeah. lots of lots of good retail. Yeah, there's some big. What are the the company that's that that are there? The big ones that are located in Egan. Um, one of the biggest in in near where we live is is Thompson Writers. Right. Yeah, yep. that's a. Um, employs a lot of people, and many people from my neighborhood work there. Um, but we've we've seen some businesses come and go. But I I'm hopeful that uh, we'll continue to attract new businesses to the area. Yeah, there's a there's a big section of those those warehouses that are kind of by where mm -hmm. Thompson is, and there's that YMCA uh, over there as well. Uh, but there's a lot of warehouse businesses mm -hmm. there, and they couldn't have been too happy about the Democrats' vote when they uh, increased the warehouse taxes. Uh, no, they were very negatively impacted by that, um, as well as other other businesses by the the package of business taxes that were were enacted. And, and fortunately, those uh, you know in this session, those uh, those taxes were are no longer going to be uh, around. But it's. It seems a bit disingenuous to me that, uh, you know, they go ahead and pass these taxes that, um, you know, people said before they passed them that they were job killing mm -hmm. taxes, that mm -hmm. they were going to send businesses to the Dakotas, to Wisconsin. And it's just frustrating that they pass these tax increases and then later on, right before the election, they, they come in and, and they're the mm -hmm. heroes for 
repealing the tax <laughs> exactly. increases. Pat, patting themselves on the back for undoing the damage that, that they did themselves. But I think, I think voters are smarter than that. I think that they uh, have better memories and it, it was, um, they'll see through that. And the unfortunate thing is a lot of the damage was already done. Many of those businesses uh, cut, cut jobs because of that um, in anticipation of the in increased costs. And, and those are jobs that may not come back. Yeah, and that, that's just it. It's the, it's the climate or the environment of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I, we were getting ready to file our, our taxes for 2013 because we're anxious to find out mm -hmm. if we owe or if we get money back. We, we're not sure. And then all of a sudden, these new tax laws were passed, and uh, people are telling me on the TV that we got to wait till April 2nd. Now, granted, we're past that now, but <laughs> that we have to wait till April 2nd to, to be able to file your taxes. And, you know, do you think that the, this type of uncertainty that's being created by the Democratic led government is it, you know, is that, is it fair? Is it uh, the way that government should be, or, or how do you think it can be changed? Well, I, th I think it, it absolutely is unfair, and I think we've seen businesses already that have raised prices in anticipation of things that may happen, but they don't know if they'll happen. Um, and with regard to the, the tax law and, and, and was it going to be changed, were there going to be uh, uh, things that would benefit taxpayers, it, it was really a lot of... Um, really bickering within the Democratic Party, who of course is in, in control, um, that, that held things up and, and, and kept people waiting and wondering, should, should I file? Will there be any benefit to me? Now, unfortunately, many of those benefits aren't going to be retroactive and, and didn't affect people filing this year with, with any kind of benefit. But I'm hopeful with a, maybe a change in, in leadership in next, uh, next session, we'll see more of that and more of that money being returned to those who earned it. And, you know, before we talk too much about policy, I just want everybody to, to get to know you a little better. So if you could just, you know, talk about, were you, were you born in Minnesota? I was, yes, born so and Minnesotan, raised. Minnesotan, born and raised. <laughs> Absolutely. Have you ever left the state before? Or? Uh, I, briefly. I, I attended uh, college my first year in Colorado uh, and uh, ended up coming back. I missed the state. I missed the people. I wanted to be close to family. I think sometimes you have to go away a little bit to realize how, how good you have it. And, mm -hmm. And uh, and it loved Colorado, beautiful place, great school. But uh, it, it was nice to be back, and I did end up finishing out then my college years here in Minnesota. I was born in Mendota Heights, so I, I never veered too far from the the South Metro. It's it's kind of what I consider home. And um, went to college at Augsburg in Minneapolis, then finished up there and, and lived in the city and enjoyed that. But when it was time to settle down, we, we looked, we knew, my husband and I, when we were looking for homes, knew that we wanted to be uh, in the South Metro area. And you had mentioned the, the schools in District 196. That's really probably, even though we were not yet married when we started looking for a home, um, it, it was really first and foremost on our mind having good schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we did purchase a house initially in, in Apple Valley, and he lived there for a year. And I moved back with my folks and until we were married. Mm. But uh, and then ultimately uh, ended up settling in Egan. So, yeah. And uh, you have a, a, a pretty uh, interesting story about, uh, you know, how you were born. And can you, can you tell the, oh, the sure. audience? Yeah, sure, about yeah. That? Um, I, as I said, I, I, I grew up in Mendota Heights. Uh, my parents are... are my, my dad actually had lived there his whole life, um, but I was, uh, they're not my birth parents, I was adopted. I, uh, my birth parents were young, uh, professional, not married, and not in a place in their, their lives where uh, they felt they were ready to, to marry and raise a child, and so I was uh, put up for adoption, and I'm so very thankful that that, that happened. Uh, I have the most amazing parents. Uh, my, my adoptive parents are my parents, and they're, they're phenomenal. Uh, they're both educators. My, my mom just retired from teaching, a uh, long career in teaching, and my, my dad was at the U for a number of years, retired mm -hmm. a couple years ago, and, and uh, they're, they're wonderful. And I'm just thankful that I, uh, I had the opportunity to, to have that happen and to be here. <laughs> doing this today. Did you, did you say, have you had uh, any contact with, with your birth parents? Um, I have met my birth mother, yes. Um, we, we've had a, a couple of meetings. She's a lovely woman. She's, uh, I believe, now in Arizona. She's retired, and uh, my birth father is on the East Coast. Uh, he's in business and successful, and, you know, they have their life, and, and I 
thankfully have, have mine, which has been really wonderful. Yeah, and you know, it's a, it's a great story because, you know, when people have a, a pregnancy that was unplanned mm -hmm. or unexpected, that, you know, sometimes it, you, they can feel like their back's against the wall mm -hmm. and, and they have to make decisions very fast or, or they may have an overwhelming feeling like this is like the mm -hmm. end of the world or something. And, you know, it's just good to hear that there's um, there's options out right. there, mm -hmm. you know, to, um, you know, take responsibility mm -hmm. still um, and cherish the life aspect of it and Absolutely. give people the opportunity to, mm -hmm. to live a life. and. Uh, you mentioned you have great uh, adoptive parents, mm -hmm. and it uh, looks like that they raised you well. And I mean, did, mm -hmm. does it feel like you, you know, that do you have that feeling like, you know, these are my adoptive parents, but these are my real parents? How does that? They are 100% my parents, and um, I think I think they're as thankful as I am that things w happened the way they did. Um, I won't say how many years ago when I was <laughs> born, but uh, yeah, I mean that's a you know my my birth mother. I give her credit. I was I was born in the 60s, so there it was a different mm -hmm. climate. It was certainly. Um, pre Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. but I would I would hope that she would have made the same decision. But um, you know, I I'm really happy to be here, and and I think that that young women or women of any age that are faced with that situation need to hear those kind of stories um, before they make that kind of decision because uh, you don't know what the outcome will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, speaking of women, we had a, a good strong. Uh uh, female leader here earlier, Angie Hasek, the chair of the Minnesota College Republicans. Yeah, it was great. great having her on. And, you know, I mentioned, and I think you were listening, just about the rise of, mm -hmm. of women in politics. And you're seeing more and more women standing up and uh, taking part in community uh, activities, running for office, holding office, mm -hmm. and, and, and doing these types of things. And can you talk about how important that is for uh, other women and mm -hmm. girls who are out there who maybe are struggling with empowerment mm -hmm. or, or, or how they can overcome that? Yeah. Well, I think fortunately we are well past the, the, the point where women feel like they don't have a voice in, um, in public policy and in things that are happening in, in their lives and in, in, uh, in government in particular. Uh, just looking at, at the my district and the surrounding districts, it, it, looking at the representation in the, the Minnesota House, and it's primarily females. It, it, we have uh, really some strong representation in the South Metro with uh, great female candidates and, and legislators. Um, and I, I think it's not something we can sit back and say, okay, we're, we're here, we've done it. And I think you see that, and there are a lot of groups now that are, uh, their sole mission is to find great women to run for office and uh, I think it's great to be part of that wave. I'm excited to be part of it and as as the mother of uh, a daughter who's getting ready to graduate soon and and uh, you know begin her life as, as she's nearing adulthood I think uh, it's exciting to, to be a role model in that in that aspect and say you know gender isn't isn't an, a, a defining piece as far as what you can do and the limits and and I think, you know, I, I don't like to look at groups of people and sort of section us off by uh, whether it's gender mm -hmm. or ethnicity or faith. Um, but that being said, there are differences and we bring different perspectives. And as a, as a woman and as a mother, I think that, uh, you know, we do bring a, a, a different perspective. Having been a mother for close mm -hmm. to 17 years now, I think that... Uh, there are certainly some parallels to, to parenting and to to being in the legislature. Mm. You know, you're dealing with different personalities, dis differences of opinion, uh, negotiating, uh, knowing when to pick your battles, when to stand firm because you know it's the right thing to do, and when to say, you know, there's some agreement on this. We can we can meet in the middle, uh, and knowing being able to make difficult, unpopular decisions. Uh, because you know it's the right thing to do. As a, as a parent, as a mother, I do that all the time. It, so I think that it's, it's a perspective that, uh, that women can bring, not that you know, men don't have that same perspective, but 
so I think it's good. Hmm. I think the uh, the victories that the Democrats had here in Minnesota in 2012 were, were a bit of a fluke. I think it was an off year. Mm -hmm. I think that there was some underlying things going on that brought people to the mm -hmm. ballots, which wasn't the vote for, for Democrats, but they won it, mm -hmm. uh, got that vote by default. Uh, one of the greatest I shouldn't say great, I should say worst phrases that came out of the 2012 elections was the war on women. You heard that over and over again. The mm -hmm. Republicans have a war on women. Right. They're attacking reproductive rights. They're uh, attacking women's issues in the, in the workplace and whatnot. As a Republican, and I should say congratulations for earning the Republican endorsement in SD51B, or I'm you. sorry, House District 51B, <laughs> you, and that you were unanimously endorsed. Um, yes. As a Republican, do you do you think that there's any merit to this idea that there's certain Republicans that do have a war on women? Is there any merit to that? Absolutely not. I think it's I think it's a uh, kind of a, a a quick and dirty line that that I think the Democrats feel if they can say it over and over enough, people will start to believe it. But as I said before, I think I think voters are smart. I think they're informed. I think it's it's easy to look past. Um, you know, it doesn't take much digging to look past a, a policy that, that on the surface is, is uh, presented as something that's going to be beneficial to women to see what the real ramifications are. And often, I think, the, the, the policies of the, the Democrats are, uh, in a way, a little bit demeaning to women. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, artificial type uh, adjustments in pay and things like that when I, I don't agree that that's the way to address things. So, and uh, you know, I was going to ask you too um, about uh, you know running mm -hmm. and uh, this particular election. Um, do you think you have a chance to win? Absolutely. I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't. It's it's uh, it, it's a lot of time. Uh, I'm asking a lot of others that that I need to help me in this endeavor. And uh, I would, would absolutely not be doing it if I didn't think I had a, a very good chance of winning. And can you tell everyone, and I, I like to ask candidates this, because there's always people out there watching who maybe have contemplated running mm -hmm. for office, or maybe they, they feel this urge and they, they don't know how to get past it, or there's certain fears about it. But can you uh, let everybody know about the circumstances and the emotions that were surrounding this decision, this big decision that you made to yeah. run for the Minnesota State House. Sure. I, I've always uh, tried to live by the rule that if, if things aren't going the way that you think they should, if you see an injustice, if, uh, if things aren't working out, if, if you see something wrong, you, you don't sit around and grumble about it and complain and gripe. You, you, you get off the sofa and you put your feet on the ground and you get moving and you do something about it. And I was experiencing some of those frustrations. I felt a little bit as though uh, my family, my neighbors, we were, we were losing control. The government had overstepped its bounds and, and was, uh, there was too much control um, top down. And it was frustrating, and we were talking about it in, in our circle of friends. And, and uh, so when I was approached by a sitting representative about considering a run for, for this seat, um, my first initial reaction was like, oh my gosh, I'm really busy. But it, it didn't take very long for me to realize I, I, need to, uh, I, I need to put my money where my mouth is. You know, I need to walk the talk. And it's something that uh, my husband and I have always really tried to instill in our kids, too. Y you know, you, you can't complain about something. You can't be frustrated unless you're doing everything you can to change it. So uh, that's really what led to the decision, um, that and a few coffee meetings and, <laughs> and lots of discussions with, with my family. But it, it was the right thing to do. Because you're fairly, you're fairly new to the, to the political mm -hmm. process. Um, have you always been a political person? Have you always been paying attention to what's going on at the state capitol? I've always been interested. I've always been involved. I, I, I like to say I've been active, but not necessarily an activist. Um, I, I've, I've tended to uh, find candidates that I feel somehow moved by, and, and I've helped out you know, with time and money, um, always taken an interest and, and followed what's happened. And uh, for the most part, my circle of friends is, is in a similar situation. So we always, you know, tried to stay involved and, and up on things. But this is, uh, this is my first, uh, first time as a candidate. I've never run for office. Um, I've, I've been on, you know, boards and been involved in things that were 
appointments and mm -hmm. um, but no, nothing that I've ever no no elective uh, this is my first campaign yeah. to state that you know we're living in a, a time that's uh, very partisan I think is, mm -hmm. a, is an understatement I mm -hmm. think y especially campaign time you'll see neighbor against neighbor with sign mm -hmm. against sign and they'll, they'll get into these ridiculous partisanship yeah. and it almost seems like there's there's more partisanship on the grassroots than there is in the state capitol sometimes um, but a lot of people are concerned about the harsh rhetoric they hear mm -hmm. the the back and the forth the nasty words um, you know i think a lot of people are seeking for someone who is more of a stateswoman mm -hmm. or statesman a leader somebody who can compromise mm -hmm. in certain some situations and my question uh, for you is is um, can you work with democrats to get smart policies done that are going to benefit all of Minnesota equally? Mm -hmm. well, I think one of the biggest problems we're seeing right now in our state government is we have one party in control of everything. So they don't have to reach out to the other side. They don't even have to listen to the other side, and often they're not. And and it, it's frustrating. We, we definitely need more balance. Uh, right off the bat, that's, that's going to help in, immensely. Because the reality is there are some things we agree on. And uh, when, when one party is in control, they can take those things and they can lump them in with other things, a whole lot of bad stuff in this uh, supplemental budget bill that, that you know, we've recently been hearing about is a, is a good example because it was a whole lot of wasteful spending with a few good things in there that, that everybody agreed on. Mm -hmm. and, and the unfortunate thing is because they didn't need any Republican votes, uh, the, the Good members of the of the House I, I, Republicans tried to pull some of those good things out, and um, said, "Let's let's vote on these separately because we agree on this, and these are good things, and these will help people." But it didn't happen; it was all lumped in together, and that's a situation where, if I were faced with that, I, I wouldn't have voted for it because I think it's wrong. I think it's it's not good representation; it's not good leadership to do something like that. Um, you talk about voting for like an omnibus bill that the, has all these goodies and right. earmarks attached to it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think there are there's a time to to stand firm and there's a time to look for things that uh, upon which we agree and and there are those things out there. Um, I think it's just you can sometimes choose to uh, stand so firm on policy that you get nowhere, and that's not good for the people either. So I think it's it's a matter of of looking for common ground when it's there, and um, and acting upon that in a in a responsible manner, and uh, also standing up for what you know is right when it's when it's needed. Yeah, I talked to Angie Hasek when she was on mm -hmm. here. Asked her a question about the economy and how her college colleagues that were graduating or about to graduate, if they if they were able to find jobs, and she seemed to say that there's still a lot of uncertainty in mm -hmm. terms of the economy that students are graduating with enormous debt loads, mm -hmm. the job opportunities that, that pay well are still uh, pretty scarce, and, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of uncertainty, at least on that level. Uh, in your viewpoint, um, is the Minnesota economy, is it getting better? I, I think we need to do more. I think we, we have to get away from uh, some of this sort of class warfare where, where businesses and business owners are looked at as the enemy because without strong businesses, there will be no jobs and, there, and, and, and no one will benefit. So I think that uh, we have a long way to go, to be honest with you, and I don't know that we, we've made up any ground. You know, we lost a lot of ground last session and, and made up a little bit maybe in that regard this session, but it, 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 there's still a long way to go. And I think there are a lot of things that can be done to create a thriving business climate. Uh, our, our, our business taxes are one of the worst in the country. And that's not going to entice businesses to come here. It's not going to entice businesses to stay here. And when we have neighboring states that have much more business friendly policies, it, it, it only adds to the, you know, adds to the disincentive for businesses here. So I think we have a long way to go, and I think that uh, there, there's much to be done, and I hope to be a part of that. Yeah, and Dallas, if we can uh, pull up the, uh, the screen here, we're going to go to your campaign website here, Jen. If everyone can see the URL, it's jenwilsonforhouse.com. It's a good-looking website here. She's got some nice sections. You know, you can go find out more about uh, Jen. You can 
discover some more of the issues that we haven't uh, talked about here on this show. And then you can also go on there and uh, contribute and donate to the campaign if you feel so inclined. And uh, I'm sure uh, as the campaign manager, I'd say that you have $5, $10, it all goes a long way. Like one of those signs costs about, you know, two, three bucks, mm -hmm. plus the stand that you put it in is another dollar. So if you donate five bucks, think of that. That's a, that's a sign that you mm -hmm. just put up to advertise your name in somebody's yard. And um, the other thing that Minnesota has now that we uh, didn't have two years ago was the uh, the political contribution refund mm -hmm. pro uh, program. And, and I still don't understand how this <laughs> necessarily works. So hopefully you can sure. explain. But so if, if I get this straight, if I donate my wife and I donate $100 mm -hmm. to Jen Wilson for State House. Um, I just fill out, do I fill out a, a form that I'd send in uh, uh, along with that? Or yep, how does that you work? Can, you can donate. Uh, it's $50 for an individual and $100 for a married couple once annually can be donated. And um, what, what would happen is if you donate to our campaign, uh, I would send you a receipt for that donation. And it's just a simple, very easy one-page form that can be sent in and uh, it, it it really is very quick. You don't have to wait to file for tax filing. It's just sent to the Department of Revenue. And uh, at that time, it, it takes maybe a couple weeks at the most. And that entire amount is refunded, uh, direct deposited right into your account. Awesome. Well, yeah. we're coming uh, to mm -hmm. the end of the show here. But everybody go to Jen Wilson for house.com. And I'd like to thank you all for tuning in. SCC Television Studios and SPNN. Thank you to Angie Hasek and Jen Wilson for State House. May God bless you. May God bless America. And vaya con Dios.